Welcome to Nicaragua, the land of no street addresses, and no one reads maps, and no one even has maps. And I'm Scott Allen Miller, this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua, and today I'm going to go into why you can't get a street address or find your way around anywhere in Nicaragua. Why, Nicaragua? Why is it like this? Living in Nicaragua, I get asked all the time, is there like an address for that? How do I send things places? How do I get anywhere? Just last night, someone said, why can't I buy a paper map of Nicaragua? And I understand not a lot of people have paper maps anymore, but even so, you can still get them in most places. Why don't maps exist in Nicaragua? And why is Google Maps really inaccurate and Apple Maps even worse? Like it's really rough. And when you talk to most Nicaraguans, you're going to get a response of, why would we have addresses? We don't want those, that's not a thing. Thing. And of course, no one knows how to read a map because why would they? Where would they get maps from? Sure, people may have seen a globe. They know what the outline of the country looks like because that's posted everywhere. But actually showing someone a map and trying to get them to use it often leads to confusion. How is this possible? What's going on? So people ask, does Nicaragua have street addresses? Actually, yes, they have road names, street numbers, house numbers, all those things exist, but people will deny it and no one will use it. And they're just stuck having to use this system that includes things like 100 meters west of the church on the street below the, the old market that isn't there anymore. And you're just like, what is going on? Now, technically there's some little format to this, like country, departmento, municipality, Pueblo, and then some description to get you to where you need to go. And it mostly works, but why is it like this? We gotta give a little context here. You have to keep in mind that Nicaragua was occupied by enemy military forces for the majority of the 20th century. Fighting for their freedom has been something that they've been doing almost continuously since the country was founded. They only became free of Spain in 1821, and by 1854, they were already invaded and taken over for some time, and then they got some freedom for a while, but so they had only about 30 years of being independent, and then got completely colonized, then won their independence again, and then after about 70 years, uh, they were back, and about half of the last century, they were occupied. Being a completely free, self-determining country is something that has only happened recently, and they are about to hit, in the very near future, the longest period of being free and independent in their country's history. So Nicaragua has a very different perspective on the world than most places. So the 20th century was an interesting time because things like maps that were really good and useful and the ability to travel around large areas, like in cars, were relatively new. So Nicaragua didn't have a big, strong tradition of having made maps, having high literacy rates or anything like that, because at the time, the really early part of the 19th century in like the 19 teens, they were just starting to get some of these things under their belt when they became occupied again. Now, I'm not an expert on Nicaraguan history, but I'm absolutely almost 100% certain that I am the most expert YouTuber you're gonna see today on Nicaraguan history. And the thing that happened in the early 1900s was that the decision was made that the occupying forces were very foreign and had very little experience and knowledge of Nicaragua. This is common, even today. If a force from nearly anywhere in the world was to come to Nicaragua, they'd basically be like, oh, is this what Nicaragua looks like? I have no idea where I am or what I'm doing. Because even people who live relatively close have a very big tendency to be unknowledgeable, but what Nicaragua looks like. It's one of the reasons that my channel is popular because we're showing a place people don't know, and it's kind of interesting to discover a new place. I digress. So when the occupying forces got here, they relied on street addresses and maps to be able to wage a war. Well, it didn't take very much in a very small country that is both geographically small and at the time extremely small in population. It's still relatively small today, but imagine over 100 years ago, it was tiny as lots of countries were a fraction of what they are today. It was before the modern medicine revolution and the low infant death rates started to take place. So in the early years of the 20th century, populations were just way smaller than they are today. And people didn't live as long, so you didn't have the elderly. Anyway, the population was just a lot smaller back then everywhere. So when you started having these occupying forces here in Nicaragua, the locals, the Nicaraguans just said, hey, you know what? Let's just wipe away all the addresses. Let's pretend like they've never existed. Let's get rid of the maps and let's just rely on word of mouth descriptions based on things that only we know. And so really quickly as a part of national pride and national security, people started revolting against the occupying forces by referring to things by descriptions, often 
using landmarks that no longer existed or weren't quite identifiable as their original form. That was not always the case, but that added to this obfuscation of the country. This process worked surprisingly well, and for the majority of the 20th century, they used this to make occupying the country at least super annoying, if not outright difficult and impossible, for occupying forces because they couldn't find things, at least not quickly. They would be scouring around and relying on people going, no, I think it's over there, no, I think it's over there. It really did a lot to obfuscate the country. It was an effective tactic that was very simple, but the everyday Nicaraguan who was not otherwise involved in anything was able to participate in this bit of very strong national pride, national identity. Well, when this took place over a really long time, the majority of the 20th century, and when the occupation ended, it just went into another period of long attrition war where, yes, Nicaragua was free, but it was still defending itself against an attempting occupying army. So for another large period of time, it was still still very important to try to make this happen. And by this point, sure, things like maps made by third parties were starting to exist if necessary, but it had become part of the national consciousness and generations of Nicaraguans have been brought up to not use maps, not use traditional addresses, and to understand non-traditional addresses. Or maybe it's really traditional addresses, depending on how you look at it. The idea of like street numbers and house numbers and all that stuff is actually relatively new. Sure, there was probably some degree of that in like Roman times, and I believe that the history says that there was. It's been a little time since I've looked that up specifically, but the modern system of like grids and really easily being able to identify houses based on house numbers is a relatively new thing, mostly from Britain and the US. So for both cultural reasons of not wanting to align with colonial powers who were trying to invade them, and a cultural need of identifying themselves separately from invading forces and occupying forces, it became part of the social consciousness of Nicaragua to not use maps, to not learn to use maps because that was essentially useless, and to not use the addresses that in colonial times were put on the buildings. There are still house numbers all over the country. People ask me, is it there? And they're like, yes. But what's amazing is I can stand on a street corner with a Nicaraguan who's grown up there and I'll say, oh yeah, here we are on Fifth Street. And they'll say, I've never heard of such a thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's a big thing on the wall here that says Fifth Street. And they're like, there, no, there's not. I'm like, look, this has clearly been here for hundreds of years. And this is like, you walk past this every day. How do you not notice that there's a sign? But they've been taught socially over the years, over the generations to absolutely ignore and deny those things and pretend that they don't exist or pretend that it's not real or it's not official or whatever. But if you go on Google Maps, it has gone around. Someone went around, got all the information off the streets, and Google Maps almost always has correct highway numbers, even brand new highways. Now, Nicaragua 169 that bypasses Managua, Google doesn't have. I don't know how they lost it, but Apple Maps has it. You can look it up so we know what the number is. And if you're out there, there's signs that say the number. So Nicaragua is making an effort to put these numbers back and to not hide them anymore. That's been a long time, but they haven't changed this social nature of people being taught that you don't read maps and you don't talk about addresses. And when you need to, you deny it. No one realizes why they're doing it anymore. It's just something they were taught to do and probably taught by like grandparents who don't remember why they were taught to do it as kids. And so it's just become a thing, but people treat it as a mark of national pride. So when you're here in Nicaragua, you're going to be faced with a lot of people who are like, we don't do that. And I commonly like have Google Maps on my phone. I'm like, hey, I'm driving. Can you look at the map and tell me? They're like, no. And it's not always the case. There's going to be some people who can read it, but there really isn't a tradition of doing this and people are just taught to ignore it. And there's a very big lack of carto cartographic literacy in the country. And that's something that really does need to improve. But even regular basic literacy, reading literacy, is a relatively recent explosion here in the country. There was a push against literacy for obvious reasons during the occupation. So the majority of the 20th century, people were not encouraged to become literate. Of course, many people were literate. It is a country famous for its education, its literature, Ruben Dario, and so forth. So yes, there were a lot of people who could read. So there wasn't a push push for universal literacy the way that there is in many countries today. But starting in 1979, and especially after the war that followed 1979, the current government then and now has pushed very hard and literacy rates are very high again. Nicaragua is an extremely literate country with a great appreciation for literature and the arts, as it traditionally
originally was. Nicaragua is the educational hub of Central America. And León, where I'm at now, is the educational hub of Nicaragua. Maybe not the largest number of students, but definitely the highest concentration of them. This is our number one export here is education. At least that's what we say. Maybe that's not true. But that's what I've heard a lot. And when you walk around the city, it is evident that it is at least really important here compared to most parts of anywhere. Universities are universally the thing here, as are private high schools. Now, it is good that Nicaragua has gotten reading literacy at really high rates, but it is time to start reintroducing cartographic literacy into the programs, absolutely, because you don't want another generation being brought up without the ability to read maps. Being able to read maps is important, but what about the changing of the cultural need to not use street addresses? Nicaragua has gone so long without these, they would essentially have to reintroduce them, even though they technically still exist and those numbers still are out there. My house has a number. It has a location, but nobody ever repeats it. It's not on our lease. It's not in something we discuss. It's not on any legal paperwork. When you cross the border and have to tell people where you live, where you're staying, you don't use the house number. You're allowed to, but they will ignore it. They need the description. But all of that is fine. I'm actually going to argue that Nicaragua should not go back to the regular address system. And this is going to surprise a lot of people and annoy a lot of people. And I'll admit that I think they should have gone back to the address system long ago. But I think that one, the point of national pride is very important. And Nicaragua is a small country that needs to hold to its traditions, even if they're relatively recent, because it needs to keep that identity going. And that's just important. So I understand why they were hesitant to start moving back to addresses when it would have been potentially prudent in late 1979, or at least by 1980. At that point, they were not confident. They were hopeful, but they were not confident that the country was going to remain free. So at that time, they couldn't make the decision to go back because it was still a military tool to help protect a fragile democracy or a democracy to be. They were still in the pro. It took many years to establish a democracy, of course. That's not an overnight thing, even in the case of something like the United States. We always talk about uh, 1776 being when the United States started, but in reality, the democracy as we know it today didn't take form until 1789, 13 years, which is really good by 18th century standards, but it still is a bit of time. So Nicaragua did something similar. It wasn't quite as long, but it was a number of years before that could be established. During that time, they were super fragile in trying to hold the country together. They, one, didn't have resources to start doing that kind of stuff. They're focused on trying to get people reading and, you know, building houses again. When the time finally came, there was, again, disruption. So more years where literacy was not pushed for several years. And then once it was pushed again, well, cartography just isn't the high priority. And there's, again, this mark of national pride. That makes sense. Now, at this point, we've gone far enough that there's really no benefit to hiding those things, not militarily. It's not going to protect the country. Is it a bit of national heritage? Is it a thing that will always be a talking point that sets Nicaragua apart from other countries? Yes. And that may be a reason alone to keep it. I totally get this. Living here for three years continuously and over a period of nine years, I appreciate just how far Nicaragua goes to make sure that you understand this is Nicaragua. And it's important, not just for you as a visitor, but for the Nicaraguan people to maintain an identity as a small population in the middle of a zone where people are often swarmed swallowed into bigger groups or misidentified or just struggle to maintain a national identity. Nicaragua has a very unique position in the region, and this is just a way to take pride in that and kind of recognize that and remind themselves of that. So all things that I appreciate and think make sense here. We also have to worry about that there is an economic impact to not having traditional addresses. Places like the U.S. and U.K. have done very well over the centuries by having really strong addressing systems, really powerful postal systems. Those were always seen as a military advantage, as an economic advantage. There's reasons that they pushed very hard for them. So wouldn't Nicaragua benefit by moving to this system? Logically, I can see why you would think so. And I thought so when I first got here and would argue for it that and I could still argue that in the very short term, it probably would have a positive economic impact. But in the long run, I want to compare this to telephones because Nicaragua has leapfrogged the West in technology in areas you would never guess. And I think that addresses are going to be one of those things. Let's take it just a moment to talk about phones and trains. Bear with me. It makes sense. With telephones in the United States, where telephones were basically first put into widespread use, you have this archaic system of punching in numbers and 
and using an insecure, very fragile, really, really terrible mechanism, but it's old. It's been in place for over 100 years and it keeps working. So they keep propping it up. And so that is just how Americans view telephony. But in much of the world, and especially here in Nicaragua, those systems were not in place 100 years ago. The use of widespread telephony is a relatively recent, I'm relative in a very large sense, right? But many decades after the United States, and you didn't get like really widespread cell phone usage until much later than in the United States as well by again, decades. So here in Nicaragua, everything was much younger and they were able to and not necessarily make a really concerted decision. But these decisions were made whether it was conscious or accidental. But here in Nicaragua, phones were supplanted by secure third-party messaging platforms that are dramatically newer and more advanced than traditional telephony. Examples include WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, Nika Abla. These things give Nicaraguans the ability to make an unlimited number of free telephone calls from anywhere that they're able to get internet access. If you need to get internet access on your phone, you probably need it for some other reason, then now you can make calls on it to an unlimited number of people with an unlimited amount of free data at to anywhere in the world anytime. Now, you can do all that as an American as well. The United States doesn't stop you from doing that, but culturally, most Americans don't have these tools or ways to be reached that way. They don't publish these numbers. You don't find a new friend in the United States, meet them somewhere, have a quick conversation, go, hey, can I call you? We'll, we'll get together sometime. Can I text you? Whatever. And they, they're going to give you a traditional telephone number for both calls or text. And that's how you're going to communicate over this completely insecure, fragile, slow, antique system that really shouldn't exist even 30 years ago and yet is still the basis for communications in the US. But here in Nicaragua, they're going to give you a WhatsApp contact or something similar, but almost always WhatsApp currently. And that means that you can reach them from anywhere without incurring cost for you or them. You also have secure communications. You also have faster and more reliable communications. You also get things like knowledge of when they read the message and so forth, or at least optionally. And yes, people think that text does that, but text does not. If you see that, you've already moved to another system that is not necessarily the one you think you're using. It's a very complex thing, but Nicaragua leapfrogged the U.S. by simply not having a ubiquitous telephony system that was legacy in place. So when phones suddenly became widely available and essentially everybody had one, they wanted to use something that made sense in the modern world and never considered using something so crazy as what the U.S. has. They didn't have it in place. It's not a tradition. They don't have to look at ripping it all out and having companies go bankrupt because they're dependent on being propped up by the government pushing antique systems that have no, no place uh, in a free market. They don't have to worry about that. The free market dictated a modern solution and it is so much more elegant. In a similar vein, when trains went into the United States, they were new and no one knew how to design systems around them. They didn't know where to put the stations. They didn't know where to put the tracks. They were guessing because it was new. By the time Europe put them in, not that much later, they had learned from the American model and were able to not make the same mistakes simply because they were following, not leading. Now, of course, American can take amazing pride in how good their train system was and how early it went into place, but Europe takes great pride today in having a much more modern, lower cost, more functional train system. They benefited by following. How does this play into cartography and maps and addresses in Nicaragua today? For all intents and purposes, Nicaragua is using an ancient system, one that goes back to places like ancient Greece and Persia. Of course, in the old, old, old world, you people had to just describe where things were. Dude, go to my friend's house. He's got the white house at the top of the hill next to the oak tree. Cool. People could find that. They knew the hill. They could see an oak tree and it's a white house it's the only one. They've been using this since people could describe things. So that's basic. Nicaragua is using a really old system. In places like US, UK, and most of the world, sometime in the last 500 years, they started moving to modern addresses. And different places did it at different times. Some places it's pretty recent. Some places it's really, really old. These systems were designed around postal systems so that the government could reach out to people. And of course, then it became really useful for a lot of purposes. But originally it was so that the government and the people could interact in an efficient way. You could run post postal services. So with this, Nicaragua is not encumbered by a system designed in the analog paper-based world of a few hundred years ago. It has an opportunity to start fresh, just like it did with WhatsApp for telephony, or it will be doing with trains, having learned from trains the world over, over hundreds of years. It can make really strategic decisions about where trains are going to go and how they're going to be used and where stations will be placed and what goes into those stations. They get to look at places like the Basel train station in Switzerland or the Madrid train station 
in Spain and say, wow, these are beautiful and functional and they do an amazing job for their communities. We want to replicate that in Nicaragua. We're not stuck just doing a, well, we had a station here 300 years ago, so we're just going to revamp it and hope for the best. They get to start fresh and that carries some big advantages. Just look at Germany rebuilding after the bombings of World War II. Sure, they lost a lot of history and that is tragic and it's not probably worth it, but economically they have boomed in the years since because they got to build newer modern cities with new modern structures and basically start over. That has benefited them a lot in the economic sense. So here with addresses, we're not stuck using a system that made sense on paper. We can do something because now we know everyone has GPS. Everyone has digital maps. Everyone has directions in your hand. That's not going to go away. We're not going to lose the technology to be able to find our way around. So we have an opportunity here in Nicaragua to simply leap over that archaic postal system. Yeah, I know it totally exists here officially in the background somewhere, but it's already ignored. It's already forgotten. In many cases, no one has a way to look it up. So it's all but gone. We can then start with a GPS latitude and longitude based system that is modern and start working from a system that makes sense in the digital world. If you go to places that use postal systems like the United States, it can be very difficult under some circumstances to find where you need to go because you're trusting that the description, because that's still what it is, that the house number and the street number and all those things are going to be straightforward. And where I lived in Carrollton, Te Carrollton, Texas, they were not. The same road existed, but not connected in many different places. Paul has visited Columbia and the exact same address exists in multiple places in the city. And there's no way to differentiate unless you use latitude and longitude. But in Nicaragua, we can just use latitude and longitude right from the beginning and start a new scheme by which we identify places absolutely accurately and very simply. And it doesn't have to, there, there are systems for this that make it very, very easy. That stuff exists. And you can put it on QR codes. You can put it in numbers. You can put it in links. You can do all kinds of things because people don't need to write down addresses anymore. That is itself an archaic thing in so many ways. And this is just a really great example. Nicaragua has an opportunity to leapfrog, partially because there's a bunch of things they haven't done in the past, partially because it's a very small country. And so making really dramatic advanced changes is not necessarily a massive undertaking. If you were to do this in the US, it would be all but impossible. It is so entrenched to use the legacy address system that they have that you would never get people to change for generations. The pushback would be incredible. But here in Nicaragua, there's so much more national pride and reasons to do so and a lack of an entrenched system that makes a lot of sense. It could really possibly happen and they could have a system that is more efficient, safer, easier, way faster, and actually go ahead of the West instead of trailing in this example, just like they have have with the telephony system and as they probably will with the train system that's about to go in, it's a huge opportunity. So that is why traditionally Nicaragua has eschewed having addresses, why map reading is not something they've been teaching and why it actually presents an amazing opportunity for this amazing country in the future. Thank you for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, if you would be so kind as to share on social media, tell a friend or family member, someone get them hooked on the show, spread the love, let them know that we have an educational channel about relocation and travel and seeing Latin America. And I'm excited to be announcing that we are working on and very soon we'll be releasing a podcast in an absolutely different genre. And a reminder for people that generally on Thursdays, we try to do a long live stream where you're uh, completely able to jump on, talk to me in real time, ask questions, love doing that stuff. Super exciting. Had a great one last night. I will see all of you tomorrow. And please click on one of these videos that hopefully shows up on the screen while you're watching this. And if you're on a platform that doesn't show them or I've forgotten to put them up or have not gotten it to it yet, if you would take a moment to just look on the side or whatever, follow YouTube's instructions to watch another one of my videos, even if you just let it play in the background, that would be amazing.